Greetings again today in the name of Jesus Christ, our wonderful Lord and Savior. Now we're glad to see you here in the auditorium of the Northside Baptist Church today. We welcome every one of you and you that's listening out in the radio listening audience. We most certainly appreciate you tuning in to Northside Baptist Church that's coming to you live right from the auditorium of the Northside Baptist Church here in Athens, Georgia. Now this is Preacher Edward speaking. We're hoping during the hour coming up we can be an inspiration to you and you in the radio listening audience. If you get on that phone and call a friend, uh, shut in and have them to tune in and get this hour, I do believe we can be an inspiration to them. You'll do them a favor, you'll be doing us a favor, and we appreciate that so very much. If you have your Bible today, you turn to Galatians chapter 6. Galatians chapter 6 for the reading of God's Word. Now the singing and the message today will be on cassette tape. And the tape will be number 167. We have many other cassette tape. I have a list. I'd be glad to send you a list of at least 165 of our tape. And they're $3 each. And the money is used to pay for radio time. My mailing address is Virgil Edwards, P.O. Box 501, Athens, Georgia, 30603, is the zip code number. Now, if you're not getting our daily broadcast, if you're tuned to this station where you're now listening, you can get the daily broadcast each day at 12 o'clock noon. That's WNGC, the big giant station in Athens, Georgia, 95 and a half, 95.5 on your FM dial. Tune in at 12 o'clock, Monday through Saturday. And you can get our broadcast. We're now in our 37th year of daily broadcasting the gospel from the classic city of Athens, Georgia. We appreciate the opportunity, the open door, and God's people that make this possible. Galatians chapter 6, verse 1. Brethren, if any man be overtaken a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, and considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Bear you one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if any man think himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. But let every man prove his own work, and then shall he have rejoicing in himself alone, and not in another. For every man shall bear his own burden. Let him that is taught in the word communicate unto him that is teaching in all good things. Be not deceived, God is not mocked, for whatsoever man soweth, that shall also reap. But he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption, but he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. Let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. And as we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. Now my text is found in verse 9. Let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. I'm going to bring a message today that I hope will be a blessing to you because we find so many of God's people oftentimes become discouraged. We run into preachers quite often that are very much discouraged. We like to see things happening and just don't see them many times in the way of people being saved and churches revived. And many of a preacher has decided on Sunday night he'd resign then he couldn't hardly wait till next Sunday morning to come back and preach to his people. A lot of preachers done that. They get discouraged and then they kind of get over it during the week. And if you're not careful, you'll become discouraged. I don't care whether you're a preacher, a lay person or whatnot. And there's a great danger in becoming discouraged as a Christian. I'm going to point out some of these dangers today. And I'm going to speak on this subject, danger of discouragement. Now this tape is tape number 167. It'll have the message and the singing on it. And you can write in and get it if you so desire. There's seven things you do wrong when you become discouraged. Now God laid this message on my heart and no doubt there's people out in the radio listening audience that's been discouraged. You're discouraged right now. You're perplexed. You're confused. You're trying to make a decision. You don't know what to do. You're disheartened. And there may be some here in this auditorium the same way. You're trying to make up your mind about something. You've been discouraged. Many times maybe you've made the wrong move. You don't want to make a, another mistake. And you're wondering what to do. Maybe you're praying about changing jobs or changing uh, communities or churches or whatnot or uh, getting married or 
something of that uh, nature, and you just wonder what to do. Well, as a Christian, if you're not careful, you can become discouraged. And when you become discouraged, there's seven things you'll do wrong if you're not very, very careful. Number one, when you're discouraged as a Christian, you will pray the wrong prayer. Now, when you're discouraged, you better watch about your praying. You'll pray the wrong prayer. And that might get you into trouble. Moses prayed to die in Numbers chapter 11 and verse 15, and God didn't appreciate that. Moses became discouraged because of the murmuring of his people. And he just said, God, I just want to die. Just, just take me out of the world. Get me away from these people. They're driving me up the wall. I, I'm tired fooling with them. I, I just want to go and get out of the way. Now he prayed the wrong prayer. That didn't please God at all. We find Elijah also prayed to die. In 1 Kings chapter 19 and verse 4, after God had given him a great victory and killed 450 false prophets, it opened up the heavens, the rain had come down. No lady Jezebel said, I'll kill him. I'll kill him before the sun goes down. Elijah became discouraged and prayed to die. Now Elijah was God's great prophet. He should not have prayed that prayer. That grieved God. He shouldn't have prayed to die. And so he prayed the wrong prayer. Now when you're discouraged, you need to be careful about what you pray. You just wait on God. Just get on your knees and wait on God and be careful what you pray about when you're discouraged. Secondly, when you're discouraged, you will say the wrong thing. There's many of a person, because of discouragement, they said the wrong thing. And if they had their time to go over, they wouldn't have said it. If they could just call back the time, if they could call those words and phrases and sentences back, they, they, they just wouldn't speak them. They just would not do it because they did it when they were discouraged. And when it's once spoken, it's already spoken. You may try to patch it up, but it's already spoken. Moses did that when he called God's people rebels. We find in Numbers chapter 20 and verse 10, he became discouraged and he said to his people that he had never been born. He said in chapter 3 and verse 3, I wish I'd never been born. And he cursed the day he was born. He wished he'd never come into this world. He's discouraged. He said the wrong thing. God brought him into this world. And he shouldn't have said, I wish I'd have never been born. That was a hand of God. And he said the wrong thing while he was discouraged. And if you'd have been in Job's place, and you could see why he'd make that statement. David said the wrong thing when he was discouraged, everything going against him. David said, all men are liars. In Psalm 116, verse 11, he said, everybody's all men are just a bunch of lies. I don't believe any of them. He was discouraged. Now, once in a while, people tell you the truth. Now, back when I was a boy growing up, I, I took a man at his word. But this day and time, you better take it with a grain of salt. People lie to you. They'll look you in the face and lie to you and tell you one lie after another because they, their father, the devil, is a liar and they're doing what... Their father, the devil, tells them to do. Now, you, you shouldn't uh, tell lies. A lot of people like to tell lies. They'll climb a tree to tell a lie before they stand on the ground and tell the truth. And so David said, all men are lies. And then we find that Jonah, he also um, uh, said the wrong thing. He said, I, I, I might as well be dead. I, if, if you're going to let those Ninevites live, I might as well be dead. And God had rebuked him for that. God said, you're more concerned about things around you than you are about the people down there that have a living soul. He said the wrong thing. And we found old man Jacob in his old days when his hair was gray and his long white beard hanging out down on his chest like headed out like rye. He said whenever they came and told him, said now uh, there's a man down in Egypt said for you to send Benjamin down there, you get no more corn. The old man said, I can't do that. I can't do that. He said, all these things are against me. But were they? No. They were in his favor. They all turned out to the good. But he said, these things are against me. And no doubt many times in your life you've made that statement. You said, everything's against me. Everyone in the house is against me. People on the jobs are against me. People in the community are against me. People in the church are against me. Everybody seems to be against me. Have you ever made that statement? Well, if you did, you made it while you were discouraged. There's somebody for you. Not everybody's against you. You need to realize that. Some people are for you. Now, Jacob said, everybody's against me, but Romans 8, 28 worked out in his favor. It all worked out so he could live five more years and get through the drought. And so you'll, you'll say the wrong thing uh, whenever you're discouraged. Number three, you'll think the wrong thing 
Now, if you're not careful, when you're discouraged, you begin to think. And you'll think the wrong thing. You'll get the wrong opinion. You'll get wrong ideas in your mind about the situation, about your job, about your family, about your companion, about your children, about your church. You'll get the wrong idea in your head and mind when you're discouraged. You will think the wrong thing. Elijah did that in 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 10. He said, I'm the only preacher alive. I'm the only one that's, that's really standing for anything today. Uh, no doubt he said, I'm the only old-fashioned, fundamental, independent, uh, missionary Baptist living today. I'm the only one. I I'm all by myself. And I'm fighting the battle alone. And God said, now listen, Elijah. I have 6,000 people out there that haven't bowed the knee to Baal. said, oh, you shouldn't uh, I make a statement like that. Or maybe 7,000. 7,000, I believe he said. You shouldn't make a statement like that. I have people out there that, that love me, that know me, and you're not the only one that's serving me. And a lot of times people get the idea that they're about the only one that's really doing anything for God. Sometimes preachers get that idea. They feel like they're the only preacher that's doing anything for God and getting anything done. But God has his servants. He has his men in various places. And he has his people in good churches. And they're trying to serve the Lord. And, and of course, don't ever get the idea that you think you're about the only one that's really doing anything for God. Elijah thought that. He thought the wrong thing. He is discouraged when he did that. We find that John the Baptist became discouraged when they put him in jail. And he wondered why that Jesus would allow him to be put in jail. John the Baptist was a forerunner of uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. And he knew that he was a forerunner of Jesus Christ. And then they arrested him because he rebuked old King Herod for taking his brother Philip's wife. And they put him in prison. And they was to cut his head off, which they did. And while he was there in jail, the devil began to tell John, said, now listen, John, uh, there's something wrong somewhere. That man you call Jesus, you thought was the real true Messiah, said, evidently, if he's the real true Messiah, he'd get you out of here. He said, you shouldn't believe in him as uh, the true Messiah. And poor old John sat there and he thought about that thing. He said, now, that may be true. He, he may not be the one that I thought he was because if he's the real true Messiah, he could bring me right out of jail without any problem and here I am sitting here in this dirty stinking jail and I wonder where he is and what he's doing and, and he became very much discouraged and he began to think the wrong thing. Now you need to be careful about that. When you become discouraged you begin to think about the wrong thing. You think the wrong thing about your companion. You think the wrong thing about your children. You think the wrong thing about your parents. You think the wrong thing about you, the church members in the church. You think the wrong thing about people on your job. You begin to think the wrong thing while you're discouraged. You need to be careful about that. Because you can do it. John the Baptist did and, and John the Baptist got a committee together. He said, I want you to do me a favor. I want you to go and find this man Jesus and ask him if he's really the true Messiah. Is he really God, is he really the one to come? I want you to go find out for me. And this committee went and found Jesus. And they found Jesus busy uh, healing the sick and, and taking care of the poor and preaching the gospel and raising the dead and so forth. They came to him and they said, uh, uh, Jesus said, we are a committee from John the Baptist. And he sent us to you and he wanted us to come and ask you if you are the real true Messiah to come. Or do we look for someone else? Jesus didn't say, now you go back and tell John I am the Messiah. He didn't say that. He knew John knew what he was supposed to be doing as the Messiah. He knew John knew something about the Old Testament. Because he's the last of the Old Testament prophets there. And he knew. He knew about that. And, and he knew that uh, something about the Old Testament scriptures. And Jesus said, you go back and you tell John that people are being healed and Raised from the dead and poor have the gospel preached to him and so forth. You go tell John what I'm doing. And that's all he needed to say. And that committee went back and reported that to John the Baptist. They said, you know that man, he's healing the sick, he's raising the dead, he's preaching the gospel of the poor, he's feeding people, he's performing miracles. John said, that's all you need to say because that has to be him. I can't understand why he won't come and let me out of prison, but that must be him. That has to be the Messiah. And that settled John down and 
He didn't think the wrong thing after that. Lost his head. He'll get that back in the resurrection. But he uh, thought the wrong thing. If you're not careful, you'll think the wrong thing. Now, when you're discouraged, you be careful about that because bad thoughts can come into your mind. You can imagine things that are really not true and cause you a lot of heartache. And then number four, you'll do the wrong thing. When you're discouraged, you be careful about the moves you make and what you do because you'll do the wrong thing. Elijah did the wrong thing. He ran like forked lightning from old lady Jezebel. I mean, he took off. He ran for many miles trying to get away from old lady Jezebel. She had a sharp butcher knife waiting for him. She wanted to cut his head off and, and he ran. He did the wrong thing. He ran instead of trusting God. Jonah tried that. Jonah became discouraged. And God said, Jonah, I want you to go preach to the Ninevites. Now, Jonah hated those Ninevites because they were the Assyrians. And they had caused uh, Israel a lot of heartaches. And uh, he, no doubt Jonah had promised God he'd preach anywhere God wanted to preach. And God said, Jonah, I want you to go to Nineveh. And Jonah became discouraged and said, I'm not going over there. Let them die and go to hell. I don't care anything about those Ninevites. Go ahead and destroy them. I'm going to Tarshish. And Jonah did the wrong thing. He tried to run from God. Now you know what happened to poor old Jonah. He wound up in the, the stomach of a whale for three days and three nights. But after God finished with him and after that postgraduate course in Fish College, he's ready to go and do what God wanted him to do. Moses became discouraged. He knew that he was a man to deliver Israel. Went out among his people one day among the Egyptians. And there he saw an Egyptian abusing an Israelite. And he killed that Egyptian and hit him in the sand. Moses lost his temper. He did the wrong thing. He was discouraged. He wondered why his people had to suffer like they did. And why they were there uh, having to build those houses. And they're under great responsibility and a burden. And he became discouraged and he killed that Egyptian and covered him up in the sand. But you know, he had to flee because of it to the backside of the desert. He is discouraged. He, he did the wrong thing. If he hadn't been discouraged, he wouldn't have killed that Egyptian like that. But he was discouraged. Simon Peter became discouraged on one occasion. He said, they've crucified Jesus. And now he's uh, been crucified. And we gave up all of our business and we left our homes to follow him. And now he's gone and... Fellas, I'll tell you what let's do. Let's go back fishing. And he led some of the other disciples back fishing with him. And Jesus came on the scene and rebuked him openly. He did the wrong thing. Now Simon Peter, if he hadn't been discouraged, he wouldn't have done that. But he is discouraged. The prodigal son became discouraged and left home. But he was glad to come back when God finished with him. We find that Naomi and her husband, God had planted them in the promised land there in Bethlehem. And there came a drought. God told them what to do in time of droughts and so forth. And instead of doing what God said do, getting on their knees and praying for God to take care of the droughts, they took off down into Moab. And Naomi went down there and buried her husband and two sons. And she said, I went away full. I've come back empty. Don't call me. Naomi called me Mirah. She was filled with bitterness. Find that she did the wrong thing. She made the wrong move. Now, when you're discouraged, you'll make the wrong move, do the wrong thing if you're not careful, and it's going to cost you. Be careful what you do when you're discouraged. John Mark made a mistake. He became discouraged, did the wrong thing in Acts chapter 13, verse 13, and then according to verse, Acts 15, verse 38, John Mark started out with Paul on a mission tour, and he became discouraged. He said, I don't like this. too rugged out here. I'm going back home and take it easy and stay with Mama. And so he left and went back home. Later on, Paul refused to take him on another journey. He said, no, I, he can't go with me. If he's a quitter one time, you're a quitter again, and I'm not taking him along. Now, John Mark became discouraged and went back home. Now, when you're discouraged, don't make any major decisions. Because if you do, you're bound to make the wrong move. And then number five, you'll get in the wrong place. When you're discouraged, you'll end up in the wrong place every time. Elijah ended up on the juniper tree. He ran, he sat down on that juniper tree and there he kind of settled up and, and uh, he was in the wrong place. He shouldn't have been there. And God sent an angel down there to bake the, the old fellow a little cake and try to encourage him. He was sitting there in the wrong place on the juniper tree. I may be speaking to someone today, you're right now on the juniper tree. 
You're sitting in the wrong place and you know it. You need to ask God to help you uh, find the right spot, whether it be on your job, your community, or whatnot. And so he's under the juniper tree. We find that Jonah got in the wrong place when he was sitting under the gourd vine. As the gourd vine grew up, he sat beside the hill overlooking Nineveh. He's going to watch to see if God destroyed that, that wicked place. And God let a little gourd vine grow up, and then God sent a little worm and told that little worm, said, you take your soul over there and cut that gourd down, vine down on the head of that Baptist preacher sitting over there pouting. And Jonah was in the wrong place, and that worm cut that gourd vine down right on top of his head. He was in the wrong place. Now, you can't stay in the wrong place too long and get a gourd vine fall down on top of your head. And so he was in the wrong place. Then number six, you get in the wrong spirit. When you become discouraged, if you are not careful, you get in the wrong spirit. I've seen people walk around in the wrong spirit, in the wrong attitude. Just can't seem to cope with the situation. Can't seem to get over an incident that maybe it's happened. Just can't seem to get things straightened out. Just carry that old wrong spirit with them day in and day out. Well, you're getting the wrong spirit when you get discouraged. If you hadn't got discouraged, you wouldn't have got in that wrong spirit to start with. But you became discouraged. You got in the wrong spirit. And then you fuss too much on your husband, you fuss too much on your wife, you fuss on your children. You got in the wrong spirit. You fuss on your pastor, you fuss on the church, you fuss on your manager where you labor, you fuss on everything because you're in the wrong spirit. And you get in the wrong spirit when you get discouraged. You need to do something about that. Discouragement is one of the greatest tools the devil has to use on people. That is the greatest as far as I know. And then number seven, you make the wrong decision. Now, this is very important. Don't make any major decisions when you're discouraged. If you make a major decision while you're discouraged, nine times out of ten, you're going to make the wrong decision. Be sure that everything is clear. God told those Israelites that don't you move till you see that cloud moving in front of you, then follow it. At night, don't you move until you see that pillar of fire moving and then you follow it. Be sure everything's clear. Be sure that the clouds are there. Be sure the fire's there. And then you make your move. Now you're most certainly get into trouble if you try to make your move while you're discouraged. I know of a pastor one time became discouraged because the church wasn't, uh, seemed like moving as fast as he'd like to see it. Some of the members began to grumble about it. One of the greatest preachers I've ever known. In fact, he was a preacher that helped lead me to God along with my mother. And he uh, became discouraged and listened to some of the people. And a church called him up in North Carolina. He lived in Greenville at this time, Greenville, South Carolina. And he left a good work where he had really worked hard to build and went off up in North Carolina. He's the most discouraged man I ever saw. He realized he had missed it. He realized he made his decision of discouragement. He should never resign his church and gone up there in the first place. Got up there out of the will of God, suffered several years. Finally, they called him back near Greenville and then eventually came back to that same church he left to start with and spend the rest of his ministry. But he left in discouragement. He should not have done that. And it's not easy to get discouraged and make the wrong decision. The Bible says in Luke chapter 18, verse 1, he spake a parable of them to this end. They may not always to pray and not to faint. Keep praying, looking to God. The Bible says in my text, be not weary in well-doing for in due season. You'll reap if you faint not. If you're doing well, don't be weary. Don't be discouraged. Keep looking up because you'll reap in due time if you faint not. The Bible said God will never leave us nor forsake us. He tells us that in his wonderful word. And no doubt there's somebody today in the radio listening audience in this auditorium. You're right now discouraged about something. You're despondent. You're perplexed. You're somewhat confused. You can't understand why certain things happen. Don't get discouraged. You're going through a testing, a trial, and God's going to see you through, and God's going to help you, and you're going to be a far better person when you get the right answer. And when you find that uh, God is allowing you to be tested, or maybe when you realize you're in the center of God's will and the devil's trying to discourage you, don't be discouraged. The Bible says in Isaiah chapter 43 and verse 2, When thou pass through the waters, I'll be with thee. And through the rivers they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned, neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. God's not dead. God will be with you. God will see you through. God will help you. 
even in old age. As we grow older, sometimes we say, well, we're getting old now. Nobody wants us around anymore. God would like to have you around. God's with you. He'll never leave you nor forsake you. You become more and more precious to God, the whiter that hell becomes. So don't you worry about that. The more feeble you become, the more precious you are in the sight of God, the stronger you should be inwardly, and the more you should love the Lord. There's a man one time by the name of John G. Payton. John Payton was a fine young man, fell in love with a beautiful American girl, but he fell to call to the mission field. John G. Payton went to the mission field, and there he went through discouragement, took his little wife with him, and and he, they were there fighting the battle. They couldn't even speak the language. The people finally began to learn the language. They had a little boy, and he died. And John went out and took his own hands and dug a grave and buried that little boy. He and his precious wife were so heartbroken and so discouraged out there on that lonely island of the South Seas. It wasn't long after that, his wife took sick and had a terrible fever. And then she died. John G. Payton took his precious wife in his arms and went out and buried her beside of his little boy. They was left alone on that island, but he stayed there. He kept fighting the battle. The devil discouraged him, but he just stayed there. And let me give you this information. Amazing change in the South Seas. In 1833, Charles Darwin went to the South Sea Islands looking for the so-called missing link. As he studied the cannibals who lived there, he concluded that no creature anywhere were more primitive. And he was convinced that nothing on earth could possibly lift them to a high level. He thought that he indeed found a lower stratagem of humanity that would fit the theory of evolution. 34 years later, he returned to the same island. To his amazement, he discovered churches, schools, homes occupied by some of those formal cannibals. In fact, many of them wore clothes and frequently gathered to sing hymns. The reason was soon learned. Missionary John G. Payton had been there proclaiming the truth of salvation. Darwin was so moved by their transformation that he made a generous contribution to the London Missionary Society. Darwin's missing link thus remain still missing. See, John G. Payton, although discouraged on that island, said, I'll not quit. And all alone, he fought the battle, learned the language, loved the people, and won those cannibals to God. They built schools and churches and homes. And in 30 years' time, he had done great wonders on that island. But oh, he was so discouraged when he buried his little boy and when he buried his precious wife. He couldn't understand it. God, why would you take my boy? Lord, I needed my wife so badly, so lonely here without her. Lord, why did you take her? But he stayed right there and walked among those heathen, loved them, learned their language, preached to them, won them to God. And because of that, he brought them out of that heathenism. They win there on that particular island. Dear soul, don't be discouraged. Don't be discouraged. You'll reap if you faint not. The devil uses that as his greatest tool. That's the greatest tool in his toolbox is a tool of discouragement. He'll try every other method on you. And if he don't work, he'll take the tool of discouragement and he'll say, I'll get him with this one. If I can get him discouraged, I got him. And I got her. If I can get him discouraged, I, I have her. Uh, then I can really gain the victory. Determined by the grace of God, you're not going to be discouraged. Say, get thee behind me, Satan, and look up and keep moving on for God. Winners never quit and quitters never win. You need to move on for the Lord and make up your mind, regardless of what comes your way, you're not going to be discouraged. Thank you. You've listened well. Stand to your feet. Our Father, I pray today that you take the message that you'll use it. May someone this day that's discouraged be encouraged because of the word of God. Have your way, our Father, in this invitation. Have your way out in the radio listening audience. May much be accomplished today to the glory of God in hearts here and hearts out there. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Debbie's going to play for us on the organ as she plays. If you're in this building unsaved and you want to get saved, if you'll come down here, we'll help you to God. If you're here and you're backslidden, you want to come back to the Lord, you come down here, we'll help you back into fellowship. If you're in this building and you're looking for a church home, old-fashioned, fundamental, Bible-believing, independent, missionary, Baptist, where everybody is somebody, if you want to come and join this church and the way we receive members, you're welcome to come forward. 
we'll put you before the church. While she plays, while you pray, while we wait, we give you ample time to respond to the invitation. The responsibility is now yours. What are you going to do about it? Thank you. 